Hello, everyone. It's been one year since React Native was announced as a way of unifying how we build web and native apps. You might have heard it before, learn once, write anywhere, or as Sherlock put it yesterday, a horizontal platform. <laughs> but the biggest motivation for creating React Native in the first place was that native apps feel better. They feel better because they are capable of using all the phone's resources. Things that are not available from the web browser environment, things that allow us to create more smooth and responsive apps. So React Native improved a great deal, the, development, the native development experience. And, but we also want to make sure that users keep having a first class experience. And for that, we are investing heavily in performance because we believe that performance is key when it comes to a good user experience. So by the middle of the last year, we started a new team at Facebook, uh, the React Native performance team. And our goal is to make React Native as fast as we can. And we believe that we can make React Native apps at least as fast as the native ones. And today I'm gonna talk a little bit about what we've been working on. So to start off, I just want to take a couple minutes to go through a very quick overview of how React Native works. And as you might know, React Native apps are mostly written in JavaScript. Uh, you can write native code and we try to make it easy to do so, but most of the time you shouldn't be required to. And your JS code will be bundled with the JavaScript part of React Native that includes React JS and the React Native built-in modules and APIs. And it will be compiled to ECMAScript 5 using Babel. And then when you, when you run your app, uh, it will be executed by JavaScript Core. That's Apple's JavaScript virtual machine that's available by default on iOS and will be packaged with your app on Android. So, Ide and Shrock already talked a little bit about how threading works in React Native. But when you launch your app, it starts running the main thread. And React Native will load your JavaScript code and will start a new thread to run it. Moving it to a background thread allows us to reduce the contention in the main thread. That's where the native UI lives. And we try to keep it as available as possible to keep your app responsive. So React will then render your components on JavaScript and this will generate a bunch of uh, native view operations to be executed. So these view operations, such as create, update, and delete, will also be executed in a separate thread that we often call as a shadow thread. We call it that way because it only has the shadow nodes that are basically basic objects that only have the necessary information to calculate the layout. So it's basically just doing the math to know where it should render your component. So after that, all the native views will be created and rendered, and that's when you can actually see your app on the screen. So if you note at the bottom, there's also a block with native modules written with a bunch of threads coming off it. So on iOS, every native module will have its own thread pool by default. And on Android, all the native modules will share the same thread pool. But the point here is that all the native modules work is done off the three main threads that we have now. So that's about all I wanted to know to talk about architecture. And let's talk about performance. So our goal was to improve React Native's performance. But in order to do so, we have to be able to measure it in the first place. If we start working on optimizing anything without having proper data, we'll have to guess what's the bottleneck. And there's a good chance that we'll guess it wrong. So in the best case scenario, we'll end up with a premature optimization, which as Kenneth already said, premature optimization is the root of all evil. And in the worst case scenario, we might actually end up hurting the performance. Since if, if you don't have how to assess how is, what's the impact of our changes, we won't be able to tell if it was good or not, or, unless it's something very major that we can actually feel by just using the app. So to illustrate that, I just wrote a sample app that I'll show how to identify the bottlenecks and evaluate the optimizations we make. So this is a very small feed in which we are hiding some languages. Uh, some words that's, that are actually programming languages. So let's take a look at what the app looks like when it's running. So it takes a while to start up, and you notice that when we scroll, it lags because it's taking too long to render each, each post. So that doesn't give us that really smooth uh, feeling and experience that we're looking for. So let's see some of the, the tools that we can use to investigate these issues. So there are three tools that I'm gonna talk about today. 
And some of them are only available on iOS right now, but we are working on, on making them uh, more consistent across platforms. The first one is the Perf Monitor. It's a small overlay that works in app that gives you some quick and lightweight insight into how, how your application is behaving. The second one is SysTrace. So SysTrace is available by default on Android, and we have implemented something very similar on iOS. It's a marker-based profiler, and it's very good to give you some macro-level overview of how the application is behaving across native and, and JavaScript. And the last one is the CPU profiler. This is a JavaScript profiler that's actually built into JavaScript core, but currently it's not exposed anywhere. So we added some hooks to allow you to have fine-grained profiling in your React Native app. So let's take a look at the Perf Monitor first. So it's this overlay, as I said, and you can drag it around, and it has up to five fields. The JavaScript core one might be hidden if it's not available at the runtime. And the first one shows a resident memory. That's the current amount of memory that's allocated to your process and it will grow as you allocate more memory. The second one is the size of the JavaScript core heap, and it shows how much memory your JavaScript is using. Uh, this will only be updated once a garbage collection happens due to some limitations in the API, but it should give you some insight. The third one is the view count, and it has two numbers. Uh, the bottom one is the number of views your application currently has, and the second one is the, currently, is the number of views that are currently on screen. So the bottom number will often be bigger due to views that can be uh, optimized out, so nested text, such as net, nested text, sorry, uh, that can be merged, and views that are off screen that can be optimized out. After that, we have two graphs. The first one is the main thread FPS, and it will update every second, and will tell you how many frames did you manage to render in the previous second. So we aim to keep it at six FPS as long as possible. Uh, that's like as far as, it's the frame rate of most of the current phones, so it's as good as it can be. Uh, the other one's the JS FPS. And even though we are not actually rendering uh, from the JS thread, uh, the, update, the updates are still driven from JS since they come from React. So frame drops in this thread will likely affect your app's responsiveness. So the next thing that it gives you is that it might be helpful uh, is that it, if it's available, it will print the garbage collection logs to Xcode so you can no, if we're generating too much garbage. So let's see how we would use a perf monitor in the sample app. So you shake the device to show the dev menu. Sorry. Yeah, you shake the device to show the dev menu. You show the perf monitor, and then you just use the app. And as we scroll, you'll notice that the JS frames goes like super down. So it's, it shows that something is low in JS, but it doesn't give, you, doesn't give as much. So usually from here, I just use SysTrace to have a look at what's the overall system state. So before I said that SysTrace is a marker-based profiler, but what does it mean? It means that we have to explicitly add some code to the app in order to have information show up in SysTrace. But React Native already has a reasonable set of markers by default that will include uh, markers on sensitive bridge operations, such as JavaScript loading and execution, it will automatically inject markers on all the native modules, both the built-in modules and the ones that you write. Uh, it also has markers around React lifecycle methods, such as render and mount. But in case you want to see more than SysTrace is showing you, you can actually manually add markers to your code. So this is the API. I know it's disturbing that the first methods doesn't match the case of the other ones, but it's actually a macro. It has some special behavior due to perfect reasons to reduce overhead. So it's intentional. So there are just four methods. The first one's for synchronous operations, and it has to start and stop in the same thread. It will show up as a simple block in the, in the output graph. And the next one is asynchronous events. Those allow us to start and stop in different threads, and will show up as the same blocks. You can specify the thread to group them. And yes, the next are flow events. There are just arrows that show in the graph that are helpful to indicate how our computations are flowing from one thread to the other. Immediate events are the ones that don't really have a duration, such as a vsync or a garbage collection, for example, and will be an almost invisible tick in, in the graph. And you can also add markers from JS. But right now, we currently expose sync and async events, and they have a uh, limited signature, 
that just takes the profile name that will label the block in the final graph. So to capture a trace, the process is pretty similar to using the perf monitor. You just bring up the dev menu by shaking the device, you press star sys trace, and you interact with the app. In this case, we just scroll. Then you shake again, and you stop sys trace. Once you stop it, it should automatically open the trace in your browser, and should look something like this. So it's a lot of information. But if you look at the left side, it's all grouped by the threads that you, that you have. And the blocks are created with the APIs I described before. And Sysrace is really nice if you want to understand what's happening in your app. So you see what's running in which thread and what started it, if you look at the flows. And it can also be helpful to identify bottlenecks. So mostly you can find architecture bottlenecks because it's not super fine-grained. But it, you can easily identify if something's wrong, like these massive blocks on JavaScript. So if we zoom in in that zone in one of those massive stacks, we we'll see that they last many frames. Like these vertical stripes are, are the frame boundaries, and if we look at the middle of the stack, we can see that there's a call to uh, update component list view, which means that we are updating the list view. Uh, but the culprit is actually at the very bottom. It's a call to render a static render component. So this doesn't give us much. Like static render could be anything. It's like it's built into React. In an app this size, where we basically just have a single component, we could probably just look around and find what's wrong by tweaking the methods. But let's not guess and see how we can find with like 100% sure uh, what's the bottleneck. So for that, we use the CPU profiler. Uh, in order to use the CPU profiler, you have to compile a separate dynamic library uh, for the target iOS version. It should be easier than it sounds. Uh, we provide a make file with, Java, with React Native. You can run like a one line command and it will build the, this dynamic library. And after that, you can just rerun your app and you automatically show up a new option in the menu. So you start profiling. Uh, you can, uh, the process for generating the profile is the same as, if, as with SysTrace. You can simply shake the device, start profiling, interact with the app, do what you want to profile, shake again and stop. And then you get a pop-up like that that will give you the location to your profile and tell how you can load it to, to visualize with Chrome DevTools. So if you haven't seen it before, it looks kind of like that. And here we will use the bottom-up profile that will show us the most expensive leaves uh, at the top. And here, the top one is anonymous functions, which doesn't give us much either. It takes 48% of the execution of the program, which is a massive amount. If we compare it to the second one, it's 40%. That's the program that's basically when it's executing top-level stuff or it's idle. So here's, uh, but if we expand it, we can see all the colors of that anonymous functions and how much of the time was spent when called through that color. So the number, the almost 48% in the top one, is basically the amount of time that was spent in the anonymous function when it was called through for each. That doesn't give us much either. But if we keep expanding, uh, now we can see a function that's part of the application code. Uh, it's called filter text. It takes 47.9% of the time. And the location, that's actually in the index file of the sample app. Uh, we can take a look at the implementation. Here's what it looks like. Uh, it's not the best piece of code I've written, I have to admit. It takes a time proportional to the number of languages you have times the length of the text squared. Uh, but we can uh, speed it up by making it slightly shorter. Uh, we just create a regex of the words, and it should be much better. And here's what it looks like afterwards. So it starts up much faster. I scroll as fast as I can, and it's pretty okay. So let's talk about, now that you've seen how to optimize it, let's see what we've done to optimize, Java, to optimize React Native. I'll split it in two parts. So product optimization, that's basically uh, what we've done to optimize our product, and hopefully it can give us some insights on how to optimize your own React Native products. And some core optimizations that, we've, that are things that we've changed the framework itself to make React Native faster. So product optimization first. And the nicest part about product optimizations is that, they're, and it's something that you should keep in mind, is that React Native apps are, before anything else, React apps. So, most of the optimizations that we do to products are the same that you would do to a web React app. 
So the first one is component keys. Uh, you, if you have a list in React, sorry, sorry, if you have a list in React and you don't put keys in your components, you get a warning saying that you should add it. That allows React to identify when you move items. So if you have a huge list and you remove the first item and you are just using array keys as the indexes, React will just delete the last component and re-render the whole thing. Uh, we had issues internally with a video product. Uh, as you might have heard uh, in, this, in Steve's talk, playing video is super expensive because we have to re-render many times a second, hopefully six times a second if we, we have very good perf. So I started investigating and I ran a C-trace and it looked kind of like that. It's okay, but you have nothing to compare with, so we don't know what it should be like. We just know that it's not good because you use the app and it feels bad. So I compared with the older version, and if you look at the JavaScript thread, it's basically the same thing. But the other two threads are doing much more work. If you look at the shadow thread at the top, and it's the second one at the bottom, at the bottom it's basically empty, and at the top it's like a massive amount of work going on. And if we zoom in the main thread to see what's going on, I select the method so you can see the list at the bottom. Hopefully it's a little bit small. But it's basically creating a lot of views, moving stuff, deleting stuff. So it's redoing the whole layout, every frame, when rendering a video. That just doesn't work. So where in the old one, if you compare, it was just changing the transform matrix of the video that should be super cheap. So it went all crazy redoing the whole layout just because you picked your keys wrong. So it, it was a one-line change that got the product back from less than 10 FPS to 60 FPS. The next one is should component update. You can implement should component update to take control over, over React on whether your component should update or not. And if you don't implement it, React will always try to update your component. When you change the state of the component, uh, the, it will traverse the whole subtree to check what's changed. But by implementing it, you can actually optimize your components, updating strategy, allowing React to skip that whole subtree. So sometimes you have a very expensive component that takes a lot of data, but you can simply compare the data based on an ID or something like that, and that's a base case scenario. You do a quick check instead of comparing a bunch of data, and the whole rec React reconciliation is much faster for that subtree. Sorry. The next one is the same idea of should component update. Uh, the easier way of making things faster is by doing less work. And quite often we render more things than we need right away, which slows down the app. There was a great talk yesterday by Aditya, and people have been pushing this as a general concept in the web for a while. That's just send out whatever is necessary to start loading your app, and then progressively load the rest of the page. We can do something similar in React. We make the component render first only what's necessary and add the rest of, uh, and update progressively, adding the rest of the content for that component. So this allows us to start with a much smaller subtree that will render much faster. And we've used this technique extensively on React Native products to improve the TTI or time to interact. So next, let's talk about core optimizations. Apart from products, we've also been working on optimizing the framework itself, so every app is gonna get faster. So some of the optimizations we've made include debatching. So if you watched the first talk uh, about React Native when it was announced, you probably heard that React Native is completely async and batched. And to illustrate what that means, here's another c space in case you liked it. Uh, so there's a lot of stuff going on. So if we break it down, we start with the initial script execution. That's when we inject your JavaScript into the VM. So it has to parse, to generate the bytecode, it will execute the top level functions, your requires, it will set up the environment, and all that stuff. After that, everything is ready, we can execute our application. That's basically render your top level component that you register when you create a React app. So this will basically just render, call it react.render. And after that, we can create all the shadow views, as I mentioned before. And we have all the shadow views, we can calculate the layout. Once we have the layout, 
we can finally create the native views. With the native views, we add all of them to the screen, and then it's when you can actually view your app. But do you notice something very bad about this graph? This is a dual core phone, and we are only using one thread at a time. So there's, it's no good if you have a lot of threads, but only one is running at each time. So if you look at this, the left side, that's the list of threads. Like There's a bunch of them, and, but it's only using one at a time. So because of all the batching, many of the parts of the system end up idle, waiting for its dependencies to finish. But the way that the bridge is implemented is that we call JavaScript with the action that has to be performed and it returns a batch of native calls that were triggered during that execution. The only way of, to execute native side effects is to return that from the entry point function. After that, there's no more JavaScript running. You already returned. The thread is idle. So it turns out that we can actually have synchronous functions in JavaScript core that allow us to call back to native during the execution, from the middle of the JavaScript execution. So they're not part of React Native public APIs, and that's a design decision, because it would be pretty bad to execute anything expensive, synchronous, uh, while you're running your JavaScript. But still, we could leverage it as an optional optimization to the framework itself. We provide a function that allows JS to report partial progress, and the framework will use it if it's available. But when running in a different environment, such as like debugging in Chrome, it, it will just fall back to the original behavior. So after that is what it looks like. If we look at the shadow thread, the shadow view creation now is spread all along the React render. And we can see that now we are using two threads at a time. That's a little bit better. But the React native render part at the bottom is still a massive block that's waiting at the end, which takes me to the next logical optimization, that's incremental UI updates. So it would be great if we could also create the views as soon as we create the shadow views, so we wouldn't accumulate so much work at the end of the batch. Well, it turns out that we can just do it, and here's what it looks like. So if we label it again, we can see that now, as soon as we have the JavaScript running to render our application, we start creating the, the shadow views, and basically at the same time, we also start creating the native views. So now you can benefit much more from the multi-core processors that most of the phones have nowadays. And as a result, if we compare the amount of time that we spent uh, that was blocking the main thread during the native UI render, it's much smaller. So all that huge frame is like the app was, was not responsive anymore. So with that in mind, it sounds like debatching all the things is just the way to go. Let's not do anything batched anymore. But that's not how it works. <laughs> Turns out that the next optimization is actually batching cache requests. <laughs> yeah. So I was looking for the next thing we could make faster, and my usual workflow is that I run a sysrace, I stare at it until I find something that doesn't look right. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so I ran and I saw that. I was like, okay, maybe we debatched something that we shouldn't. And if you look at that, they are all coming from the thread that's called async local storage. Uh, that's where the cache lives. So we were just doing one, requesting one key from the graph at a time from the cache. So I figured out, well, mate, that should be batched after all. And now we can't even see anymore, but there's a tiny arrow in red. Which brings me to my conclusion, don't assume, profile, that's it. Thank you. Thank you.